Hi everyone, I'm excited to say that this time the video is actually sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. These kind of sponsorships enable me to spend more time on the channel and create more videos. So thank you Raid Shadow Legends for sponsoring this video. Last video we talked about traditional rasterization in games. This time we're gonna look at the possible future of games rendering. If you missed the previous video you can check it out here. While rasterization has taken us pretty far and still renders the latest shining graphics of the games today, it has its limitations. This video we're gonna look at what's in store for the future, but first we're looking at the present. The present of mobile gaming, namely Raid Shadow Legends. Want to experience what games can do and look like on phones these days? Then give Raid Shadow Legends a go. You've probably heard about it a million times already. But Raid Shadow Legends is a turn-based RPG you can play on your phone or PC. It has over 600 champions you can unlock and play with and tons of cool bosses to defeat. And one of those bosses is Sylvania, Guardian of the Spirit Key. She's this awesome, enormous elf looking lady. If you want to defeat her and get the rewards, then I have a little tip for you. Make sure you have some champions with healing reduction debuffs to counter her healing abilities. She deals less damage with less HP, so this way you'll quickly defeat her. Besides bosses, there are countless heroes to unlock, a fun campaign to play through, lots of challenges to do, PvP and various events to participate in. I personally like fiddling around with different hero and equipment configurations until I get it just right. This month, Raids released a huge new Doom Tower update, with two new bosses, new enemy balance of tower floors and Super Raids, which let you double up your rewards. If you join the game as a new player with the QR code or the link in the description, you'll get the epic hero Konaru, 200k silver, 1 XP boost, 1 energy refill and 1 ancient shard to summon an awesome champion as soon as you get in-game. So if you want a nice boost to start out and support my channel along the way, just click the link in the description or scan the QR code. Now, where were we? Oh right. Games already look really good, but how could they look even better? Games already look nearly photorealistic. How much better can they get? What lies ahead and where do we go from here? Well, there are some severe limitations attached to the rasterization that is used today. For example, reflections and refractions. In rasterized rendering, such information is often baked into the scene beforehand. For instance, by using reflection maps, which are sort of a blanket you wrap around an object which determines what the reflections show you. There are techniques for rendering real-time reflections using rasterization, such as screen space reflections and planar reflections. But they require a lot of computation power. Therefore, they're often used only sparingly on specific surfaces, and even then they're only an approximation. But that's only reflections. Realistic refractions are even harder to do, because rasterization generally requires that all the data that needs to be rendered exists in the scene beforehand. This is why this data is often baked into the textures in the scene. If that is not possible, developers often use dirty tricks to fake the same effect. And when you look closer, a lot of these tricks in rasterization actually reveal themselves. Admittedly, these dirty tricks the gaming industry has invented are still incredibly clever and result in amazingly realistic images. But when we take a closer look, we can see some of the cracks come through. For example, look at these shadows. They're pretty blocky and not as smooth or soft as shadows in real life. That is because rasterization uses shadow mapping to determine where the shadows are. The way it works is that essentially the scene is rendered from the perspective of the light and everything that the light cannot see is in the shadow. Makes sense, right? Serves that are blocked from the light should obviously have a shadow on them. But when you look around your room for a minute, you almost never see shadows this hard. Shadows seem to have a soft edge to them. Okay, easy enough. We'll fix that right up. We'll just give shadows soft edges where we fade from complete darkness to the illuminated surface. Done. Hmm, but wait, that shadow looks way too dark to be real. Shadows are almost never that dark in real life. Okay, no problem. We'll just give everything an ambient bluish color so nothing is ever perfectly dark. Just like in real life. Hmm, but what if we have several lights? Shouldn't they also be able to light up the dark areas? Oh yeah, okay. Then we do another pass for the other light and combine the results for all the lights. Oh, but what about light that's coming from mirrors and 
light that's reflecting off of different surfaces. What about the shadow of a transparent object? And okay, okay, stop. Uh, do you see the problem that's starting to form for rasterization? Of course, there are tricks and workarounds for all these problems, but what are we actually doing? We're not considering why these problems occurred in the first place. Because what actually causes shadows, and why aren't shadows perfectly sharp, and why are they almost never completely black? How does light travel? Well, ray tracing answers all of these questions and more, so how does it work? Let's start by asking what we actually want to achieve with this technique. We would like to replicate how light travels in the real world as closely as possible. So, how does light travel in the real world? Well, the basics of it are this. We have a light source such as a light bulb or the sun which emits photons. The photons in the light bounce off of objects, making the light lose a bit of energy every step of the way until it eventually meets your eyes. This bouncing of light rays and photons is what is simulated with ray tracing. Alright, got it. So, let's make the camera that renders the scene our eye. Then we need to simulate light rays from a light in the scene and render every light ray that actually hits our camera. Ray tracing done. Well, technically yes, that is how it would work, but just think about how much computation power is wasted. Out of all the rays emitted from the light, maybe about 5% actually hit our camera. So that means more than 95% of our effort was wasted on useless information. But what can we do? There's no way to predict beforehand which light rays will hit our camera. And if we have multiple lights, the problem becomes even more complex. Well, luckily some very smart people figured out that it doesn't matter which direction you follow the light rays path. The outcome will always be the same. So instead of tracing the ray from the light to the camera, we can just shoot the ray from the camera and trace it towards the light. And that's the basic principle of ray tracing. We shoot rays from our camera for each pixel we would like to render and trace them to see what they encounter. Now, let's look at some of the techniques we can use to deal with the various events a light ray can encounter. So first things first, how do we even determine what our ray hits? In a typical modern game, the triangle count for a single scene can easily surpass 100,000 triangles. To determine which one of these thousands of triangles is hit by a ray tracer is a huge task. And that's just a single ray. Remember, we have to shoot a ray for each pixel on our screen. Checking all 100,000 triangles for each pixel on our screen is way beyond what consumer hardware can do 60 frames per second. So how do we figure out what we hit? Well, there are several techniques similar to the binary space partitioning used in Doom. The most common technique is using what is called a bounding volume hierarchy, or BVH. We use this to divide our space into bite-sized pieces, so we don't need to check all 100,000 triangles, but only a small subsection. Building a BVH is actually pretty similar to the binary space partitioning used in Doom. Just like in BSP, with BVH we try to split the scene into equal halves. But where BSP splits the physical space, with a BVH we try to split the amount of polygons in the scene. As a basic example, consider this scene. Now consider each way we can split the amount of triangles in the scene. Notice that we only need to examine the centers of each triangle as anything between those centers won't change the amount of triangles on either side. So for each center of the triangle we can split either vertically or horizontally. This gives us all the possible split planes we need to check. Next, out of all of those we want to pick the best possible one. But what determines a good split plane? Well, as we said before, we want to divide the amount of triangles as best as possible. But with BVH, we also want to take the surface area of the triangles into account, together with the amount. If you want to implement this yourself, the cost of a split plane is determined by the following formula. For everybody else, just remember we are simply trying to divide the total surface area of our triangles in our scene as equally as possible. We continue doing this until dividing our space any further does not yield any improvements anymore. With the surface area of our triangles nicely divided and our BVH built, determining what our ray hits becomes much, much easier. Now, instead of having to check all the triangles, we can simply check what node our ray hits in our BVH. Let's shoot a ray at the example we had before and see what happens. You can see that now we just need to check for each level in our BVH which bounding volume our ray hits. When it hits the bounding volume, 
check one level lower to see which one it hits there and you repeat this until you've reached the very bottom of our tree. Once we know exactly which bounding volume our ray hits, we can check the triangles that reside in there and determine which triangle in the scene is hit by our ray. Ok, now that we know what we're hitting, we need to know how to light it. To calculate the amount of energy received from this ray, we need to consider a few things. First, just like in rasterization, we take into account the angle of the surface we're hitting. The more it's facing towards the light, the brighter our point becomes. Next, we look at how far the point we hit is from the light. The closer you are to the light, the more energy we receive. Finally, and this is the most important step, we shoot another ray in another direction and add the energy it receives. But where do we shoot the ray? Well, that is determined by the roughness of the material. The rougher the material, the more directions the next ray can go. A perfectly smooth material, such as a mirror, will only shoot the next ray in a perfectly reflected direction. Alright, so that determines where we shoot the ray, but how much energy do we receive from the ray? Well, in the real world, any surface that you can see absorbs some of the light and reflects the rest. We do the same thing in ray tracing, and the amount of light we absorb and reflect is once again determined by the material's roughness. The rougher a material, the more light it absorbs, and the smoother material, the more light it reflects. So, say we have a surface that absorbs 80% of the light and reflects the rest. When one of our rays hits this surface, we know that 80% is absorbed. So we check the angle of the surface, we check the distance to the light, and that determines 80% of our final result. The remaining 20% is reflected, so we shoot a new ray in a random direction. This new ray hits another surface. This time, we encounter a perfect mirror, so 100% of our ray is reflected and 0% is absorbed. So, we shoot another ray, which is perfectly reflected, which determines for 100% of what our result will be. This next ray hits a light, which gives us 100% of the energy of that light. So, going back, now we know what the result is of our ray. 80% is determined by our surface and 20% is extra brightness received indirectly from a mirror facing a light source. But when do we stop bouncing? Do we just keep going until we eventually hit a light? What if we are stuck between two mirrors and one of our ray leaves the scene and never hits a light? Well, the solution to this problem is one of my favorite parts. Because, similar to the real world, the bouncing of rays is all based on probability. When we hit a surface that absorbs 80% of the energy, what we're basically saying is that 80% of the ray gets absorbed and 20% gets reflected. This means that every time we hit a surface, we throw a die to determine if we shoot another ray or not. That way our rays don't get stuck bouncing around infinitely. Then to get the correct result for a pixel, we just need to take the average color value of all the rays we shoot. This is why in most ray tracer you see the picture go from grainy to sharp. It takes a little while for these averages to balance out and to produce the correct result. So now that we know the basics of light travel, we can basically do anything as long as we specify how a surface affects the light. Even things that were really difficult to do in rasterization. Think for instance of repeating levels of reflection. We can show a mirror in a mirror and basically have an endlessly repeating picture in the reflection of surfaces. As long as you specify how a mirrored surface bends the light, it's easy. And think about an even more advanced technique, refraction. For instance, when looking through a lens or a strangely shaped glass surface. All we need to do is specify how the glass bends our rays, and it all appears before our eyes. We can even combine the two, making a surface partly reflect and refract at the same time. Just like with a mirrored surface, we can specify how many get reflected back and how many can get through. The beauty of ray tracing is, the fundamentals of our logic never change. We can easily give our rays 50% chance to reflect and a 50% chance to refract to make a very realistic looking glass globe. The logic is exactly the same as before. The only thing that changes is how the rays get manipulated. But making more realistic pictures isn't the only thing that is made possible by ray tracing. We can do other things as well that would be either impossible or very difficult to do with rasterization. One such example is using ray tracing to make truly non-Euclidean spaces. Something we've seen in the previous episode. Just like we can bend and manipulate the rays that bounce off of surfaces, we can also change them while they're traveling through space. For instance, by defining a 3D grid that changes the length and direction of the rays based on what grid cell is hit. 
That way, our 3D space can act like a lens that warps the space around us. Another very interesting thing that can be done is seen in this tech demo. Like we don't have to limit ourselves to just simulating light. Sound also travels through the room, bouncing off of different surfaces, changing the way sound reaches your ears. Just like with light, we can use rays to simulate sound waves, where smooth surfaces produce a more hollow, echoey sound, and surfaces like cloth and carpet dampen the sound. And as you can hear in this tech demo, it really lifts sound simulation to the next level. So, if ray tracing can do all of these amazing things, why aren't we using it everywhere? Well, as you might expect, ray tracing is a very demanding process. Therefore, consumer hardware isn't yet fast enough to render modern AAA games with 100% real-time ray tracing. Still, ray tracing is getting used more and more. So let's look at what we can do to make the process faster. Nowadays, you see graphics cards with dedicated ray tracing technology built in. But what exactly is it that makes graphics cards so good at ray tracing? Well, the main difference between a computer's graphics card and its CPU is the amount of cores it can perform a task at once. Modern consumer-grade CPUs typically have up to around 64 threads to work with. But when we look at GPUs, we are usually talking about tens of thousands of threads. If we use the GPU's power for ray tracing, instead of 64 rays, we can suddenly process tens of thousands of rays at the same time. You can imagine how much faster the process becomes if we use the GPU instead of the CPU. So wait, if it has that much more threads and processing power, why aren't we just using the GPU for everything? Well, that is because the GPU's core is much, much simpler than a CPU's core. The CPU can perform more complex, intricate tasks that a GPU's core cannot do. So, if we want to delegate work to the GPU, we have to break it up into very simple, easy to process parts. But besides using the GPU, there's a vast amount of very interesting optimizations which speed up the ray tracing process to squeeze out every last bit of performance from our hardware. But as they usually involve a lot of complex math and go into really low level functionalities, we won't go into them here. I think you can expect to see more and more ray tracing in the coming years. Already games are starting to use real time ray tracing and while the performance isn't quite there yet, ray tracing is certainly becoming more and more ubiquitous. I hope this video has helped you to understand the basics of the techniques and the technologies that make ray tracing possible. Thank you for watching. Thank you for helping me get you a bit wiser. Thank you for watching the video. If you liked it, please give it a like. It helps people find the video. If you want to see more like this in the future, then make sure to subscribe to the channel. I'll try to make some smaller videos as well, so you can enjoy some more frequent uploads. Special shout out to Neutron and Tainser for being my top tier supporters. And thanks to all you other patrons for supporting the channel. You guys are the best and allow me to follow my dreams. Thank you all so much.